allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, uh, Kelly, Doug's on uh, vacation, so you're filling in. Anything for the agenda from you? Uh, good evening, Mayor. No, there are no changes to the agenda by staff. Uh, Council? Nothing. Uh, uh, I move we adopt the agenda. Is there a second? Second. Uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? The uh, agenda is adopted. Open forum. Uh, is there anybody that would like to address the council? Uh, seeing none, let's move on. Uh, next item, consent agenda. Uh, uh, visitors, staff, council, anybody want to take anything off the consent agenda? Hearing none, uh, I move we approve the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. Uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Hearing none, that's unanimously approved. Uh, next item, uh, Kelly. Okay, good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, I'm happy to report that we have a new uh, HR and Communications Manager, um, Gwen Campbell, uh, who we hired. Today was her first day. Uh, she brings a wealth of experience. Um, she has some city experience back in uh, Washington State, uh, and most recently she's worked for uh, People Serving People. So with that, I will uh, introduce Gwen to you and let her say a few words. Hi, well, uh, thank you very much. I'm very excited to be here, first day, so this is like a bonus part of the day. <laughs> um, as Kelly said, I, um, I have over 15 years of human resources management experience, at, specifically at two small cities in the state of Washington, and then also as a consultant for many years. And then my most recent experience was as the development director for People Serving People, which is the largest shelter for uh, homeless families in Minnesota. And so did a lot of communications um, in that position. That was part of uh, my area of responsibility. So just very excited to be here. Um, had a chance, I think, to meet almost all the staff today. And um, looking forward to really digging in, getting started. So. Thank you. Well, good. Welcome aboard. Council? Thank Welcome. you for joining Welcome. us. Okay. Great. Thank the, you. Thank you. Uh, first item, uh, new business. Uh, Kara, I believe. Oh. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I do have a PowerPoint here for this next couple agenda items. Um, so the first topic on the agenda that I'm going to cover is um, Carver County's road and bridge plan. So they released their updated five-year um, road and bridge plan. We were, staff was provided copies of it, so I thought it would be just a good idea to share it with the city council and just see if there's any questions or any information you'd like me to bring back to the county. So um, this first slide here on the left just shows the overall plan that they released. A copy of that was included in your packet. But I thought we would talk about what is included in the plan within the city of Victoria. So I'm going to focus on this pretty picture here on the right and walk through what was included. So um, in first beginning in 2019, Marsh Lake Road continues to be shown in their plan for improvement, um, consistent with where it's been for a while. Um, I will note that I did finally receive word late today, but it sounds like we're finally close on having an updated traffic model that will actually provide us information. So um, we tentatively have a meeting scheduled for next week with the consultant and county staff to find out what's in that model and get the project kicked back off. So. If that actually happens, I'll go ahead and send an update out to the neighbors with whatever information I have. Um, but I did speak directly with Lyndon today, so it does sound like we're close. So that's exciting. Last time we discussed Marsh Lake Road, one of the, the key piece, of course, was this updated traffic projections based on how the realignment isn't going to happen versus what was in the 2030 comp plan. 
and there was kind of a kind of a tipping point in there in terms of <coughs> reducing the traffic counts to reflect more accurately what's going to what development will have and what traffic it'll carry versus being so small that it no longer would be of interest to the county to take ownership of that road. Did Lyndon give any indication of where he feels like that? What, did he feel there would still be county involvement? Yes, he did still feel like there'd be county involvement. They ran um, four different traffic projection scenarios, three based on a couple of different conditions, but relative to um, more immediate growth of what's in the 2040 traffic projections and then one that's like an <clears throat> ultimate growth and so they he's still finalizing what he saw in that ultimate growth number um, but the numbers <clears throat> generally are lower than where they were before did, did you have any input to that process as they selected those four scenarios yeah the cities within the county provided input along the way okay. thank you yeah um so that's what is shown for 2019 is Marsh Lake Road. Um, so County Road 43 from Bavaria Road all the way through to 11 is now included, but it's in here primarily as a resurfacing project. So the pavement condition is becoming poor. If you drive that road with any frequency, it's really starting to um, deteriorate to the point that it needs a capital improvement. Typically, I didn't chat with Lyndon about the scope of that project, but typically what that would look like would be similar to what the County Road 11 project was that was completed a number of years back where they um, did some shoulder widening and put on a new surface of asphalt. Um, but included within that project that's of significance to us is improvements to the intersection of 43, 18, and 11. Um, that is an intersection that I get frequent calls, people calling, expressing concern about um, the fact that it really, whether it should be something more than just a two-way stop. So um, the city did include in our budget for this year to do preliminary engineering with the county on that intersection to determine if it's a roundabout or a traffic signal, um, what that would look like, what type of right-of-way would be needed. So I'm anticipating that we'll be starting to work on that project um, sometime probably in like that April, May, June timeframe. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if um, Doug had an opportunity to share with you, but our professional services pool that we use for all the consultants that we access for projects was um, in place from, it was a five-year pool, so from 2012 to 2017. So we are in the process of renewing that pool um, we're scheduled to have that back in front of the council in April, so I'd like to wait to kick off this transportation project until we have gone through that pool selection process. Um, but so we'll start work on understanding what that might look like. Um, in terms of this overall project, which is in the county's plan for 2020, Lyndon has indicated that as part of that project, they'd be looking at things like shouldering and turn lanes. There's some tough curves along that roadway. Um, the neighborhood of um, Lake Wasserman Ridge, the <clears throat> first one coming off of 43 doesn't have any turn lanes. I get some safety concerns about that. Um, so that's certainly the type of thing that would be looked at, but this is more of a um, resurfacing type project, not an expansion. It wouldn't be getting widened significantly from what it is. Kara, I know that even out through 2023, there isn't any projection of connecting Marsh Lake Road to Teller's Road as in the original plan going out to Waconia? Correct. Is there any indication beyond 2023 when that connection might be made? Because I think that that has um, some impact on what we do with Marsh Lake Road. So um, that connection will be development driven, so more dependent on when this part of the city of Victoria starts to develop. So. There, there isn't a need to make that connection until such time as we start to see housing development through this area. Um, right now, the city's comprehensive plan does not show that connection coming through. We're showing 
essentially it continuing at the teller's path and then jogging down to 14 because that that's what the feedback the city's been provided from the steering committee and from residents through the public process so that's what we'll be submitting to the county for jurisdictional review we'll see what kind of feedback they give us on that um, but yeah the timing of when anything would happen out here would really more depend on at what time these landowners approach the city for annexation what was the total amount of the last estimate for Marsh Lake Road? We've, no, we've never had an estimate for Marsh Lake Road. I thought we said something like three million. <clears throat> no, I mean the city, I had to put something in our CIP, yeah. so we have like 2.9 in the CIP, but that's really just kind of an out of thin air number. It isn't really tied to any improvement. Even with these estimates that you'll see here from the county, those aren't tied to any sort of actual improvement. So. We never got to the step of producing any estimates during preliminary design because we could never reach resolution on the typical session. I was remembering the $3 million number and I didn't recall that that was just a... Yeah, we put that in so we would have some idea to start budgeting something for improvements on there. That, that number, that 2.9 or 3, whatever, and again, I understand it's a swag. Um, was that intended to be the full cost of the connection, or was that supposed to be the city portion? The city portion. Um, I'm going to drag you back to 2019 for just a second here. It looks like um, County Road 18, a.k.a. 82nd Street, or, yeah, um, and the intersection of 41 looks like there's a little something happening over there on the east end, but it looks to me like through 2023, there's no investment in building out that road that goes past where. So what's, what is included, and it doesn't show up on the map, but it does show up in the itemization, is a study. So I talked to Lyndon about that today, and what he'd like to do is do a more localized transportation study of Highway 5 from 41 to Rolling Acres Road the intersection of Rolling Acres Road and 5 along with 82nd Street as one evaluation to determine how those pieces need to fit together to program improvements to them. So um, looking at the traffic impacts and they're, they're so complicated and they're so interconnected. Lyndon talks about it being challenging to widen five to four lanes without closing it in its entirety through this wetland area. So having this section completed first would potentially provide um, some improved operations during the time that this section would be constructed but um, everything's fairly interconnected so in 2018 so this year the financing plan includes a, a dollar amount now these dollar amounts are all sort of those grab level dollar amounts so i caution anybody about grabbing onto any one line, it's really more helpful to look at it as an aggregate cost. So like when we look at everything that's in here related to the city of Victoria, it's $24 million of investment in the five year period. That's probably a more meaningful number than any of the individual line items. But that being said, the plan includes $450,000 worth of a study um, that would occur he would like that to get started this year. Um, so he's reaching out to MnDOT to see what their ability would be to contribute um, cost participation in funding that study. We'd be asked to participate in some financial <clears throat> capacity too. But really needing to dial that in before we can start program programming it. A project like Highway 5 is going to require outside funding, so um, it's not going to happen within the five-year window, but needing to figure out what types of funding programs they would be best suited to pursue in order to get that thing funded would be part of what would come out of the study. So, in, thank you. And so in the event that that's, uh, that study, and I'm guessing that's not a short, <clears throat> that's a year or better to complete that study and provide a report that's actionable. Do you see any scenario where improvements begin within the time frame we're looking at here, or does that automatically make it 2024 and later? Um, certainly, so he has included the intersection of Rolling Acres Road and Highway 5 in 2022, so um, 
what that study outcome is would start to inform how those different pieces fit together. So if you end up doing the intersection first and getting ahead of it, County Road 18 is a little bit of a different scenario um, just from a, from a funding perspective. It won't be nearly as costly as five will be. So um, that's certainly within the county's ability once they understand how those pieces fit together to start to work it into their own five-year plan. You know, we'll always, they review theirs annually the same way that we do. So as new information comes forward, you can move things around. Thank you. Two questions for you. Uh, on Marsh Lake Road and 43 at that intersection, um, there's been various discussions about a roundabout or how that's going to be configured. It, would that be part of the Marsh Lake project or would it be part of the project to uh, redo 43? So the Marsh Lake Road project tentatively includes a roundabout at 14 and 11. Um, we identified through the preliminary work for Marsh Lake Road that ultimately a roundabout would make sense at the location of 43 and Marsh Lake Road, but it, there isn't enough traffic there today to um, justify putting in a roundabout, but that's something we'll have to look at with these new traffic numbers if that changes anything. But I, what the path we had been headed down was that this would just stay a standard T intersection for a number of years until traffic started to increase. All right, thank you. Secondly, uh, we talked before and we went out and visited the sites where we, uh, 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 potential crosswalk improvements. Is that the same intersection that's indicated on 18 here? And could yes. we take care of the crosswalks at the same time? Yes, definitely. Okay, and that would probably include overhead signs because of the curve there? Um, to be determined if a roundabout ends up going in at that location. But that could be included as part of this project? Yeah, okay. it would definitely be looked at. Uh, thank you. Council? A couple questions. Uh, 43, is, does the re reconstruction of 43 include uh, one or two uh, pedestrian crossings? Um, we've already been talking about one or two um, locations to do improvements. I don't think we would wait for this project because we're talking about potentially overhead signing and some striping type work that... Um, okay. So the pedestrian crossings will be separate and probably come earlier. Uh, the Teller Road thing, uh, all the discussion I hear, so Teller Road extension will happen at some point. It's not dead. It's a matter of when uh, expansion of the community warrants it. Correct. Okay. So given the fact that Teller Road will be there, uh, the fact that we had originally looked at a design where they would reconfigure Teller Road to come into uh, Marsh Lake Road, that's still controversial and probably isn't in any plans. Is that true? Um, no, it's in the county's plans. It's in so, the county's plans. So the, county, the county's plan continues to show Marsh Lake Road extending up through and connecting to Teller's Road and then eventually tying into Airport Road. Okay, so... We, the plan we're submitting to them doesn't show that connection. Okay. We show it going down and down and over. Okay. And so what, from the county's point of view, they're still viewing the fact that the uh, eastern, this part of Carver County is still going to expand and, and uh, it makes good sense to redesign the intersection at uh, Marsh Lake Road and Teller Road and move to the west to Airport Road and so on and so forth. So it's going to be, whether it's 10, 20, 30 years, it's probably going to be 10, 10 years plus, it's, it's going to be a, a traffic corridor of some sort. Is that true? Yeah, but the whole purpose of the modeling update that they're undergoing right now is to understand what those projections look like in light of today's exactly. the best information that people have right. available but, today. So we're, we're going to understand uh, how far into the future are they doing these projections? Um, 2040, but they're also running a build-out scenario. Okay, a build-out scenario, assuming that uh, there's expansion to the west, or what, do you, what does that, that mean? That we've reached our ultimate growth boundary, and that Waconia has reached their ultimate growth boundary. Uh, so we okay. have an orderly annexation agreement in place that's, going to extend beyond even what our 2040 planning limits are 
And so at some point, Victoria and Waconia touch. So the ultimate build-out scenario looks at we've all, we've all developed. So okay, so there's a stress test. Yeah. So, we're, so their, their model is going to be a stress test that shows what ultimately we have to design into Marsh Lake Road unless you want to pay a fortune for some changes 20 years, 10, 20 years from now. I, that ultimate scenario is what, you know, 40 years out? Is it 40? It, it, yeah, it, it's, it's anybody's 20. guess. Per, okay. The, the 2040 scenario is 20 years out. So that looks at what people think for growth in alignment with what our comprehensive okay. plan is that we submitted to them. The ultimate scenario is the county trying to understand when, the, when Carver County is totally developed, what are we going to need for corridors and making sure that enough right-of-way gets preserved to accommodate that potential ultimate scenario. But at what point that happens is so dependent on what happens with the economy and the market and where people move and it's, you know, speculative. Yes, I understand no one can predict the future, but... Uh, the county has made a statement uh, numerous times that uh, the economics of roads are such that, you know, you can't purchase right away, uh, realistically, um, 20 or 30 years from now, it'd probably be too expensive. So uh, leaving that discussion behind, going to uh, the other projects, the county uh, Rolling Acres Road uh, inter expansion or the rebuild of Rolling Acres Road, County Road 13, and the two intersections at 5 and 7. I've seen some letters from residents uh, that are flabbergasted that that would be 2022. I mean, it's hard for me to understand looking at the urgency of Marsh Lake Road right now versus the urgency of County Road 13 just doesn't seem to compute. Well, the city we council very... previously <laughs> identified Marsh Lake Road as our number one priority. So the as county, the, the city has, the city of council identified that. So the county is taking responded to that. Okay. And the city of Victoria opted to take the lead on Marsh Lake Road. So we're the lead agency on the project, even though it's a future county road. So um, the county has always viewed um, Rolling Acres Road is a top priority. So what they've been doing the last few years is trying to find outside funding sources. So they've been through a couple of different grant cycles trying to get outside funds for that road. They haven't been successful. Um, they certainly would like to see us jointly start working on a corridor study to try to figure out what that road's actually going to look like. Um, you know, how it needs to be rebuilt. It needs to have turn lanes at the intersection. So what does that typical section look like? Um, so certainly that's something that would be a priority to them, but they are interested in hearing from the city council that it's a priority to the city as well. But the city has uh, taken the initiative to push Marsh Lake Road. They're probably, therefore, causing a delay in the rebuilding of County Road 13. Um, I, I think they would have been willing to work on them both, but the city council wasn't identifying Rolling Acres <coughs> Road as a priority. So if if this city council is saying this is a priority, 2022 is too far out, we'd like to get working on it, they, they generally try to be responsive to what the yeah. cities are looking Just for. Just try and understand the dynamics because we, because we push so hard on Marsh Lake Road, we've effected... Uh, probably delayed the rebuild of Rolling Acres Road. It, it sounds kind of like that I, because of the a dollar amounts involved. I, they would have been able to deliver on both because they're both in their plan. So, but they did decide to try to pursue outside funding for Rolling Acres Road, and that that process just takes time. They went through two different funding applications and found not to be successful. So. Um, I do think we're at the point where we're going to have to start looking at how to fund that locally. Um, the city will have a pretty significant cost participation in that project. So under the county's cost participation policy, even for a um, project such as, such as Rolling Acres Road, we'll still have a cost short share in it. If you look at the um, information that they provided, again, you've got to kind of take these numbers at face value, but between... Um, 
Rolling Acres Road from 5 to 7 and the intersection of 5 and Rolling Acres Road, you're looking at a $10, $11 million project with a, another $2 million cost share. So um, certainly if this is, if, if feedback from the council back to the county should be, yes, Rolling Acres Road is a priority, we'd like to see you get working on it, they certainly will um, get working on it. Well, I'm just thinking. Why don't we just pull, pull the council right now and see if the council agrees that we want to make this a priority. Well, could, I ask, could I ask a few questions first? Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, with regards to Marsh Lake Road, I'm just trying to get a better understanding of exactly why that is determined to be a county road. I'm assuming it's beneficial to the city to have financially to have the county um, as a partner on that. But exactly what, what determines that to be a county road and, and what's the difference between a, that road and uh, and maybe some of our collector roads, uh, such as uh, Lakeside, Lakeside Drive, Fox Drive, uh, or Fox, what is it, uh, Red Fox. Uh, those are collector roads. And how are those roads funded and paid for? Is there assessments? Do developers pay for them? Uh, and could, could uh, Marshak Road just be a city road as a collector road? And, and what would the financial impact of that be because the residents we, we did uh, we all did get a number of emails and and uh, many of them were arguing that 14 or Pioneer Trail will never be a major thoroughfare because of the, the bottleneck at the east with the double roundabouts through Chaska and they don't think that 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 that's ever going to carry the traffic that it thought it would that they thought it might so uh, I don't know if you could just kind of touch base on some of those issues sure so um the Marsh Lake Road being a future county road has been in the city's comprehensive plan for as long as I've worked here. So I've been here since 2001. So I've been through a comprehensive plan amendment and then a comprehensive plan update that included that um, as a future county road. How that came to be predates me. Um, it's considered to be an east-west corridor, so typically that's how those processes happen is through the comp planning process. That's why it exists. So at some point, the county identified a need for an east-west corridor, picked a general location for it. The city um, at the time would have agreed to it when they included it in the comprehensive plan. Um, so, you know, typically those planning processors processes are very important from that perspective to engage and pay attention to those steps as we go through. Um, so the typically traffic will be quite different on a major roadway compared to a local collector. So like a Red Fox drives maybe going to have a thousand to fifteen hundred cars where um, Bavaria Road has a much higher amount um, and then so on and so forth where you have Highway 5 up at 22,000. Um, that really was the reason why the residents though were looking to have these updated traffic projections completed before a decision was made because they wanted a model that actually reflected the current conditions. So the scenario, the change with the roundabouts over in Chaska being built into the model and updated traffic projections based on today's growth versus the growth back in 2008, which was fairly significant. Our 2030 population projections are much higher than what our new 2040 population projections are. So uh, there's gonna be a whole host of dialogue as soon as we have those results with the neighbors and with the city council about what, what those new numbers mean for the road. And um, certainly there'll be much more time to talk about Marsh Lake Road in greater detail. Um, the funding question, so roads like Red Fox were constructed 100% by developers. So um, Lake Town 11th will be in front of the city council soon and Red Fox will be continued to be constructed through there and the developer is funding 100% of that. 78th Street is a city collector. So we financed that improvement with a combination of state aid dollars which come from gas tax funds special assessments and general tax dollars. So um, typically we're using a combination of those funding packages on our roads. So if we do have a, a disconnect between Tellers Road and Marsh Lake Road, it's very possible that that will never be a major east-west route. 
Um, it's conceivable that a lot, most of the traffic will either go south to 10 or north to 18. Yeah, I don't want to speculate about what the model's indicating until we see what the model's indicating. But are the models based on a direct uh, connection from tellers? To um, we had requested that they run a scenario with them disconnected. I don't know yet whether that happened or not. Okay. Okay. So is, is Lakeview Drive going to take quite a bit of traffic off of Marsh Lake Road? Lakeside Drive? Lakeside Drive. Um, I th it's hard to predict how local traffic within those neighborhood areas are going to, where they're going to elect to go. Um, I don't think you're going to see cars driving down here, cutting through to avoid driving on Marsh Lake Road, but if the people who live in this part of the neighborhood are going to the elementary school, they're going to take Lakeside Drive versus going out and around and back up. Um, so where those local trips start distributing once Lakeside Drive is connected is um, certainly going to be different, but the traffic model is looking at, you know, a much higher level than where, you know, five houses within this area are driving to. You mentioned Lakeside Drive. I'm sorry. Is there any news on um, the soil compaction? No. Okay. I, so I'm hoping that means it's good news. <laughs> Bring us a report on that at, sure. our, at our next meeting, or is that too soon? Um, I'll I'll try. Thank I'll you. see what they know. That's it's March. It's probably time to think about it again. Can you remind us what after our last uh, conversation there was uh, a plan to continue the surcharging for a period of time? But I don't remember when that was supposed to end, and if everything went as planned when would they be paving it? So we granted the developer an extension. So they have 10 weeks from the date road restrictions are lifted to complete the connection. Is that typically April 15th-ish? It, yeah, it moves around really depending on the weather. So don't have a prediction yet, but. Midsummer-ish would be their deadline. Yeah. The, uh, let's go back to the point that council member uh, vote, uh, raised. Can we, uh, I'd like to quickly poll the council to see whether or not uh, we have agreement to try to, to uh, ask the county to accelerate uh, the road improvements for Rolling Acre Road uh, based on the safety and the concerns we're hearing from residents. So uh, very quickly, council member Crawley, would you support uh, asking the county to accelerate that? Um, I think it merits a lot more debate than that. Um, yes, I am in generally in favor of it, but not at the expense of delaying Marsh Lake Road or at the uh, concern of expanding it and, and increasing the speed. So it, it depends. Um, a blanket support, I, I have to say no unless I understand the details. All right, thank you. Council Member Crowley? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Council Member Striegel? I think uh, elevating the priority of that study is, um, I would support that, um, but also echo some of Council Member Crowley's uh, caveats about that. Uh, Council Member Vogt? I would support uh, accelerating everything about the rebuild of Highway 13. Uh, I wouldn't stop uh, work on Marsh Lake Road, but I think it's vital that we figure out how big Marsh Lake Road has got to be and how expensive it's got to be because it, it all ties together and there's only so many funds and the city's locked into some cost sharing programs on both of these. Well, and if I could add to that, it, my reason for expressing concern is that this city's primary growth engine is at present residential growth. Our primary engine for growth is residential and the next planned expansion is beyond Marsh Lake Road and if if this ends up being some sort of a trade and that poses a challenge for growth south of Marsh Lake Road, that is a problem financially for our city. And so that needs to be understood. Yes, I think it'd be great to accelerate County Road 13, but not at the expense of, of potential financial impact to our city. Council Member Gregory. Yeah, I agree. Uh, from a safety perspective, it would be nice to move 13 up a little bit. Uh, but we do need a there's there needs to be a lot of debate on Marsh Lake Road uh, whether or not it's even going to be a county road or not I think that uh, the traffic studies are going to tell us a lot on that so we, we do need some more time to, to look at that 
Uh, I also support accelerating that. The the uh, I don't think we pull the trigger on anything until we have all of those financial details, know the layout, and we've got the residents' uh, uh, questions answered. Um, uh, but I don't think it hurts to ask the county to accelerate it. Uh, even, uh, Carrie, you said the county at one point was uh, doing these in parallel anyways and then slowed down a little bit because of our emphasis on Marsh Lake Road. Yeah, I think just um, I think what would be good feedback to the council is or to the county would be that you you're prepared to start moving with the study phase of Rolling Acres Road. And I, I think the residents would greatly appreciate that. They call me regularly looking for information on it. And the study helps provide all those answers. What is the funding going to look like? What's the how do the residents view the potential improvement? And until we have that information, we're just kind of sitting there. So um, that certainly, I think, will be feedback that they'll appreciate as they work on their work plan. In terms of Marsh Lake Road, we are still full steam ahead trying to get this thing constructed in 2019. Um, I certainly am not going to shortchange the process in order to stay on that schedule, but the traffic volumes are increasing and maintenance is a huge challenge for that roadway. So um, that that. The operation that I'm operating under is that we are still moving towards that construction schedule. And so I suspect we'll be all back engaged pretty at a pretty um, quick pace. But the, the neighbors are, I'm sure, looking forward to meeting with me again extensively. <laughs> all right. Well, I think we heard, uh, uh, I, I heard a consensus. Uh, go ahead. Just to be clear, I will support the study for 13. Right. I, uh, uh, so I heard a consensus on the council for that. Right, we clearly won't move forward until we have those details. Um, uh, but if you could deliver that message to the county, great. The one other thing that I want to point out that is a huge add is the intersection of Highway Five and the west um, leg of County Road Eleven by Dairy Queen has been added to this plan. So that's huge. Um, we have a traffic study that I haven't shared with the city council yet because we've been working on getting it finalized. The county saw the results of that study and amended their plan to include that intersection for 2021. So um, there's a lot of members of the public. If you remember the social pinpoint work that was done for the comprehensive plan and some of the public meetings, we're getting a lot of questions and concerns about the safety of that intersection, particularly with the daycare open now. So um, this is the first time we've actually seen it in a plan. So um, we'll be tracking and pushing on that to keep them moving. We don't, we don't have control over any of those legs. It's MnDOT and the county. So um, we'll be wanting to work with them to make sure that they keep that moving. I'm sorry, okay. I'm sorry, the green blip means they're doing a study or they're going to rebuild the intersection? Or? Intersection improvements. Intersection improvements, which yep. we would need if we develop the 13 acres. Um, so what the traffic study was showing was that it that intersection was going to need improvements regardless of what happens with the 13 and a half acres, but certainly it'll be helpful relative to the 13 and a half acre work to see that in process. So. That intersection didn't get included in the uh, in the intersection safety uh, safety driven. Models, safety-driven models, there's a lot more funding. So there's federal funding, but that didn't get included in that. That seems like that's a real safety hazard over there. Yeah, um, it's with all these intersection improvements, it's always a question of warrants. So up until recently, it wasn't starting to trip warrants for a traffic signal or a um, roundabout. And what we're seeing in this latest study is that the volumes are triggering that as being a reality. So... Do you know, is there a uh, preference or is, do the warrants indicate light or roundabout? I don't know yet. So not that far in the process, but just that it's a need. So typically what will happen is both get evaluated to determine what's the appropriate um, solution for the intersection. And it'll look at um, what will function better from a traffic perspective, but then also the reality of the geometry of the intersection, whether there's land available and things of that nature. What's the likely time frame? Um, so they have, they've included in 2021, which is really not all that far away. Okay, council, final comments on this? Uh, hearing none, thank you, Kara. Uh, let's move on uh, to item B, Rolling Acres Trunk Water Main Extension. Kara? Okie dokie. 
that would be me again, Mayor and Council. This is, as noted, the Rolling Acres Road Trunk Water Main Extension. We first highlighted this as a potential discussion point on the December 18th City Council meeting, um, but I want to take a step back and just talk about why this loop is needed. So when we, what what's causing this project to come up is that the University of Minnesota, um, I'm gonna jump over to an aerial here quick. So the University of Minnesota owns a bunch of property on the northeast corner of Rolling Acres Road and Five, including a number of buildings. So this is where the Apple Barn is located. They have um, some research facilities here, an office building. This whole system is on a septic system that has deemed to need to be replaced. So the University of Minnesota approached the city about um, options for connecting to city sewer. And so they will be moving forward with preparing plans and specifications to tie into the city sanitary sewer system up in this location. So whether it's the University of Minnesota or an individual landowner, if they have a septic system that's failing the first place they'll look will be to see if city sewer is available for a potential connection and if they can reasonably connect it you'll see property owners either choosing to go that way, route or being forced to go that route by the by county by carver county so in looking at that they then um, requested information about whether or not city water was readily available in the area and so um, we went and took a look at our system and we, our nearest city water is at this part of the intersection, so on the southwest corner. Um, when the Madeline Creek development was constructed, we extended trunk water main up to this location. At the time that that extension was made, so all these blue lines are the city's water system. So we have trunk, water main extended up to this location. The comprehensive plan for our water system showed um, this water main coming up through what had been the Llano Borough property and looping back into Swiss Mountain in the event that this part of the city developed. Since that time, the Llano Borough property has been sold to the Arboretum, so there is no plans for development in that area. So we had to go through and figure out how we were gonna loop the water main um, up to improve pressures up at the north part of the city and create some redundancy. So the identified place for that loop is shown in red here. So we would be taking water main from the southeast corner to the northeast corner and ultimately connecting it to um, Overlook. So our intended timeline for when we would put that loop in, what we've always been talking about at a staff level is that that would go in at the time that Rolling Acres Road is upgraded. So whatever point we get around to doing that project, we would be including in the project an extension of our water main loop. So with the University of Minnesota approaching the city about the potential to connect city water, we <coughs> did some preliminary estimating work and have some preliminary plans completed. It looks like it would cost roughly $275,000 to extend the trunk water main under Highway 5 and under Rolling Acres Road. It's expensive because both pipes need to be cased, so you have to jack an outside casing pipe and then locate the water main within that cased pipe. So that's a requirement to locate water under trunk highways. Sewer as well, you have to do that in both cases. So um, the question that we're being contemplated is essentially um, completing that first part of the loop now. Um, that would then allow the University of Minnesota to look at connecting to city water. So they would pay connection fees um, in accordance with all the city requirements for connection fees and then of course would purchase water and pay their water bill the same way anybody else does. I don't as I sit here today, have a good handle on what those connection fees would consist of. Our fees are based on the number of rec units, and so the number of rec units for their complex won't be determined until they go through the Met Council SAC determination process, which um, they are just kicking off their design work now on the system, so that work is forthcoming. But where we're at in the process, we did a little bit of work to get some preliminary plans completed. Um, if 
if the council was comfortable with moving forward with getting actual bids so we know what this would cost, our next steps would involve completing soil borings, um, having our consultant finalize the plans, and we would go out for bids. We're estimating that cost to get through those last steps to be about $10,000. And then this would be back for the back to the city council for approval once we had actual costs and bids available. And this would help improve the water pr uh, pressure for the northern parts of Victoria. Yeah, so it's the first step of that. You, they won't appreciate the pressure change until um, we complete the loop, which wouldn't happen until the Rolling Acres Road project. I, without knowing what that corridor is going to ultimately look like when it gets widened i wouldn't want to potentially locate the water main somewhere that then it would have to move to accommodate that construction so that's why we're at this point only proposing it to the northeast corner so this would only connect the arboretum and at a future date it would connect the loop correct yep and two hundred seventy-five thousand is needed to do the complete loop so this would be less than that no this is just the first part so, Do they intend on using water for irrigation? Um, I've told them that we wouldn't, we aren't agreeable to that. I would be <laughs> so about that. I said, I said no. Um, I, I said I, sus I expect that the city council would agree with me that we wouldn't want you using our system water for irrigation. They currently ir irrigate out of um, the lake. So I, the direction I've said is that I believe the city council would not want you connecting to city water for irrigation. That's not currently their intent, but... Um, Which lake? Is it Lake Tamarack or Tamarack yeah. Lake? And, I mean, they, they've acquired, to your point, the Lano Barrow property and I think aggregated some other land around there. Do we know the amount of irrigation water does it have an effect on the lake level of tamarack and if they expand it will it um they you know i didn't ask that specific question but they weren't expressing any concern with their current irrigation operation so the driver for connecting to city water is really for the buildings so that they're they have a very old pump house and well that they'd have to do some pretty significant upgrades to and they would just prefer to connect to city water versus investing in in that for their own building how much did we have to pay for the right-of-way fees to put the bike path on their property? Uh, we didn't actually end up paying them. So did they waive that? Yeah. Thank you. Only when I think uh, it was determined that there was a pre-existing right. caveat in the, in the land transfer that prevented them from doing it. And up until that point, I believe the number was about $50,000. All right, so uh, do you have a resolution then? The, um, uh, can I get a motion here? Sorry, I have one more question. So the, the Arboretum is under no obligation to participate in the cost of getting this to or across their land? Um, it, because it's in our, it's programmed for a trunk extension at this point, it isn't, whether it, whether it was um, us extending the trunk sewer down to Lake Wasserman Ridge so they could develop, this is not really the type of expense that you would expect a developer per se if the property was developed to fund that trunk extension to the property. Typically the city has been funding those types of extensions, but they will be expected to pay all of our typical fees that they would have to pay for connections. So they'll still you know, being paying quite a bit. I is that anywhere near two hundred seventy-five thousand dollars? No, I, these are expensive trunk extensions, particularly when we have to cross the highway essentially twice, are expensive. But for the request of the arboretum, would we be doing this now? Um, I would recommend that we do it. The timing is certainly debatable. So you know, if we do the whole thing four years from now, five years from now, at whatever point Rolling Acres Road gets. But up until this point, this has not been included in the capital improvement plans, have it? Has Correct. It? So we had no plans to do this, period. Until such time as Rolling Acres Road so was there were upgraded. No financial plans for this in until 
That is correct. the request of the Arboretum. That is correct. But all you're asking us to do tonight is authorize the study so that we can get a direct cost, correct. a known cost. Yes. And then we wouldn't do this until such time as we did Rolling Acres Road. We do them at the same time, is that correct? Um, the Arboretum would be looking for, for us to move forward with that. Well, they want us to go now. So they could connect to city water this summer. So the city council will be faced with having to make the decision that council member Crowley noted of are we gonna fund this project? We do have funds available in the water fund to pay for it, um, but certainly that'll be something that the council will need to decide once we and are there. And what projects are allocated for those funds at this point in time, and do we delay those projects, which we have no information on at this point? Right. Right. What's the reason that this wasn't in the CIP? Uh, because you, you know that Rolling Acres is gonna be rebuilt within five or 10 years, so wouldn't it have been in our, in our capital improvement plan? Um, so our capital improvement plan is looking out five years. Rolling Acres Road has not been something mm -hmm. I've plugged into any of our capital improvement plans because it wasn't identified as a priority by the city council. But certainly in the next update with um, the information we have here tonight, it will be included next year. So there is money in the, in the water fund, <laughs> but we also are competing for those funds with things like a new well, Correct. you know, and all the associated pump house, whatever goes with that. <clears throat> and so sure, yeah, we, we could do that. But I think to the point everyone is making, it hasn't been a priority for the city of Victoria. So I guess my uh, thought process is if the Arboretum is asking us to make it a priority, I would ask what their contribution will be to move it forward at their schedule. All right, there's no immediate need for Northern uh, Victoria to uh, get this process started? Correct. Okay. And that was, that, thank you, that prompted one other question, and that is, it improves the water pressure on the north. Do we have problems or? Um, so the problems come in more from a f fire protection standpoint. We just don't have the ideal system pressures at the dead ends up in that area. And then we have trouble with reliability because we don't have two ways to feed that part of the city. So um, I don't anticipate that there'll be some noticeable um, improvement to the customer, but it is from a water operator perspective, having that system looped does need to happen when an opportunity to complete that loop presents itself. So certainly at the time Rolling Acres Road was being improved, I would be sitting here recommending you move forward with the project. Certainly the question of whether to move forward with this part is really a question for the council to make based on the factors that you all were noting. And certainly I'll be working with um, the finance department once we know what those bid results are to understand what the impact would be on the um, other priorities for the water system funds. Okay, last question, I think. Um, do we have any interconnects on the north side with Minatrista or anyone else? Shortwood. Shortwood. Yep. So is that kind of our relief valve, if you will, or safety in the event that there is a... Correct. We, and we've um, accessed that interconnect on a couple of occasions under certain circumstances when the um, Met Council Tunnel Project was... Under construction, we ended up um, purchasing water from Shorewood for a number of months. It's not ideal because their water isn't treated, so you're mixing two different types of water quality, but um, it certainly is there. But if, if we look at it from a redundant, redundancy and fire safety standpoint, correct. it's not, it, it takes away a little bit of the yeah. urgency. Correct, it isn't urgent from that perspective. So I, I if the city council decided to not proceed with it at this time or we didn't feel we could afford to proceed with it in this time i wouldn't have any concerns from a water system with making that decision all right i'd like to suggest to the council that we direct uh, uh staff to talk to the arboretum to see since this is their priority and there's no immediate city need if they'd be willing to uh, uh contribute some portion to this uh in order to make this a higher priority for the city and what if uh, the answer is no uh, then I think it comes back to the council for a decision whether or not we want to approve this. So we table this for tonight and uh, That's what I would suggest table uh, until such time as we hear back to see what the Arboretum's response is to uh, Kara's questions. Well, I'd, I'd make a motion to table this item until we have further information feedback from the Arboretum. Is there a second? Uh, second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Uh, this is tabled until uh, we hear back from Kara.
Thank you, Kara. Uh, next item, uh, downtown pond, pond enhancement. Kara, is this one yours also? This would be mine as well. You got a full <laughs> plate tonight, huh? <laughs> so the city council authorized um, design on this project. I don't have that date in front of me, but it was um, quite some time ago. So I'm going to, since it's been a little bit, I'm going to um, spend a little bit of time walking through why we're doing this project and why it's important. So. Um, this is a map of downtown Victoria, so here's Highway 5, here's Victoria Drive, so Floyd's is here. Um, so back in 2003, the city constructed a regional stormwater system for downtown that treats all the properties that are highlighted in both yellow, well, we'll talk about the yellow first. So all the properties that are highlighted in yellow drain two storm sewer system that is um, that runs down through this area and across Highway 5 and discharges to a series of ponds located um, behind Kirklock and Park. And the reason that the city did that, it was part of our first phase of downtown improvements. So the first round of street improvements that we did downtown um, was right at the beginning of some pretty major redevelopment downtown. And the the decision that the city made at that time was that they wanted to create a regional stormwater system that would treat these properties such that whenever an individual parcel would come in for redevelopment, those parcels wouldn't be burdened with having to construct stormwater treatment on each individual site. You know, you picture right now we have, we pretty much have 100% impervious built into our system. So if you didn't have a regional pond system, each individual landowner would have be having to do um, ponding on their property. So this was built in 2003, and in 2007, the Watershed District revised their rules for stormwater management. So suddenly the system that we had built wasn't enough to accommodate the new rules. So in recent years, when redevelopment started occurring again, it's been a real challenge um, for the property owners, the city, and the watershed district to work through the permitting process associated with these projects. So what ended up happening is the Minneapolis Creek Watershed District took the lead on applying for a grant on behalf of the city to make enhancements to this pond system. Um, and the there was double benefit associated with it because not only um, were they helping us work to figure out how to resolve the permitting issue, this system also drains to Auburn. So here's the pond system that I was just pointing to on another map. All of this water drains up to Auburn, which is an impaired water. Church Lake flows through a storm sewer system that comes into here and then flows back out and goes to Auburn. So um, as part of that impairment, there is a need to look at reducing phosphorus um, and making any sort of water quality improvements that could be made. So the Watershed District took the lead on applying for clean water funds and we were successful in obtaining 265000 in clean water funds to complete this project. So um, we hired a consultant to do the design work. That design work has been ongoing in the winter and they um, completed it and set it out for bids. So um, the type of work that imp it, that's included is an expansion to both of the ponding areas and installation of um, drain tile and a filtration bench to add water quality improvements to both this pond and our other pond over here. Um, they also included, as an alternate bid, um, clean out and excavation of the existing stormwater pond. So essentially, we're going to do a dredging project at the same time. So we're getting one of our dredging projects completed. So we opened bids on February 15th. There was a surprising 10 bids on this project, which doesn't strike me as a terribly large project to get 10 bidders on, but there must have been a market for it. Um, this is the results of the three low bidders. And you can see that the low bidder for their base bid plus alternate one came in at $141,590.80. Um, 
The grant amount was $262,520 with a 25% match. So the bid results actually came in way under the grant amount, um, which is unique. We had gone into bidding thinking it was maybe gonna be the other way around, but um, the contractors have been contacted and they are comfortable with their bid. So um, we are recommending that we uh, approve a resolution accepting bids and awarding a contract for this work. I will note that the watershed district has begun looking at um, what other opportunities might exist in the Auburn subwatershed area for water quality improvements that um, these excess grant funds could be allocated to. So um, we have some amount of time, I don't remember the details of the grant agreement to fund those to spend those funds, so they're gonna be looking at um, other parts within the Auburn system to see if there's anything else that would be recommended with the excess dollars. With that, I will take any questions. Yeah, yeah can you go back? Sure. Uh, there's three bids here. The, uh, are you recommending which company to use? Oh, sorry, the low bidder. So BKJ Land Company in an amount of $141,590.80. And they're comfortable they can deliver this project for that price? Yes. Are there performance and time constraints in the in the bid or in our yes they we um, the design engineer recommended I forgot to pull that schedule before I walked in but they have a they have a fairly large window in which to complete the work and I think that um, the design engineer had made that decision towards the end of the design phase to provide a best opportunity to get lower bids and I think I think making that choice helped um, but yeah. So there'll, there'll be a performance deadline, a completion date. So if I understand the funding model, using that 141, 590 and 80 cent bid, the city would um, match about 35,000 and the other 105 or six comes from the grant? Um, correct, those are just the um, estimated costs. So the total project costs would have engineering Costs on top of that, so the where we're standing budget-wise is a little bit higher than that. Um, does the does the grant also apply to the engineering and the total project cost? Yeah, so we're sitting at right now about two hundred and twenty thousand. The engineering actually on this project was um, as a percent quite expensive because the design engineer had to go through a number of iterations to figure out what the best um, way to enhance the system would be. So what is the total here then? Um, what you're authorizing is the 141,590, but the total project budget is 221,000. So there's 55,000 roughly of city costs. Yeah. Okay. And how much have we budgeted for this? Uh, I'm looking at the finance. <laughs> uh, council members, um, we did have the uh, the grant programmed into our stormwater budget. Um, I don't recall the specific amount we had, so I'd have to look on look into that. So we assumed the grant was going to fund most of this. Correct. Well, we assumed the grant. Well, two sixty two. We assumed we would have to pay twenty five percent. Right. Yeah. What I have a document in my packet that has the ten bids, uh, which many of them are lower than uh, Blackstone and. Jed Lickey. So explain what happened with these, with the 10 bids and how it got down to three. Because... Responsive bidder. So here are the 10 bid results. I only reported in my PowerPoint the top three. So um, we're looking at either their base bid amount. So BKJ was the lowest at 134,660. Um, everybody else's base bid was higher than BKJ. And then the other amount we would look at is the base bid plus alternate one. So that's the sum of this number plus this number. Um, and BKJ was the lowest at 141,590.80. Um, the other bidders submitted a higher bid. But uh, Jed Lickey and Blackstone are substantially higher. They're not the three lowest. I mean, that's what's confusing me. Oh, on your slide, you said those were the three lowest, but they're not. Oh, well, that's no good. 
They aren't. That explains the discrepancy yes, in the numbers. Yes, there is an error on my slide, but it, these are the three low. Okay. Okay. In the that makes a little sense. Yes. The same, but okay. Correct. I apologize for that. Got it. All right. Um, we just thought it'd be fun to take the low one, a random one. The high one and one <laughs> in the one. middle. I thought we were showing a range. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The uh, council, any questions or should we bring the resolution up? Are you sure that uh, by going with the lowest bid that we're getting the best quality? I mean, this is a really important system. This is the stormwater for the entire downtown. These ponds don't look that big for that huge impervious surface. So uh, it seems to me this is a very valuable system that we need to have the highest quality on. Under state law, we are obligated to take the low bidder. Here's, the <laughs> design engineer has provided a recommendation that they are qualified to do the work. And well, with, with that said, okay, and I, I think the word responsive comes in there as well, lowest responsive bidder, and I believe that word in that context means capable, maybe have some track record, right. demonstrated ability, financial stability, all the things yes. that we can have confidence that they can follow through Correct. on what they've put forth. Correct. And um, I assume that the specific, well, let me, I don't want to assume, tell us that the specifications are sufficiently stringent and can be inspected to the point where you will have confidence that you can see the quality of the work and, and assure that it does meet the performance requirements. That's correct. So the contract consists of the city standard contract documents and then the design engineer provided detailed technical specifications. So um, we used WANC for this work. We had gone through, we had received proposals from a couple of different firms, ended up selecting them based <coughs> on the fact that they were familiar with the system and had worked for the watershed district on the grant application. They do a ton of this work, so they were very qualified for coming up with the right design, and the watershed district signed off on that design. So um, we'll be inspecting the improvements and certainly tapping into WANC if we <coughs> run into any surprises along the way that we want some additional technical support. And Bob, it's, it's safe to assume that there are contracts have the clauses for performance and warranty such that we could hold the contractor uh, uh, accountable should should there be issues or problems? Yeah, so, so, so Mayor, this is a good opportunity to talk a little bit about the, the public contracting laws in Minnesota. CARE has done a good job of that. But the answer to your question is yes. Uh, as a matter of law, anytime we publicly bid a contract, any contract that's over a certain dollar threshold, $100,000, by law, we're required to get a performance bond, so a bond from the company that's going to do the work that secures their performance on the project, in addition to any guarantees that they give about the quality of the work over time. We have to get that bond, and then we also have to get a payment bond, which is a bond that secures them in paying any subcontractors that they have. So the city's protected. It, that is correct. Yep. Got it. Thank you. Uh, Council, any other questions? Uh, I move we approve uh, 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 the resolution accepting the bids and awarding a contract for the downtown basin enhancement project. Is there a second? Second. Uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Uh, that passed unanimously. Uh, next item, payment of future uh, Supreme Court legal fees. Mayor, before we go in there, a comment, uh, please. Mm -hmm. um, at the last meeting, the council voted to seek an opinion from the attorney general uh, regarding conflict of interest on this. And so I'd like to make a motion that we table this item until that uh, opinion from the attorney general is received. It, it, it seems only sensible that we not have to revisit it again, potentially based on the, uh, the outcome of that opinion. Uh, council, is there a motion? Uh, Wait a second, before we uh, go to that point, uh, uh, you gentlemen are, are both now participating in a discussion and trying to table an item that directly ties to the payment of your personal legal fees. Mr. Attorney. Yes. I believe Council Member Corley has a question for you. Go ahead. The mayor seems to think I'm conflicted in um, seconding a motion. Uh, well, so, uh, Mayor and Council, if I understand, first of all, if I understand the motion, I think it's the, one of the two mo possible motions that are listed in the staff report. I guess you, you took a, the same action or similar action a couple of agenda items back. 
I think we refer to it there, and I think every city that I work, work with refers to it as tabling. I think technically under Robert's rules, the last motion that you made to table was really a motion to postpone to a date certain, but that's, that's just interesting uh, uh, information about Robert's rules. It, it matters a little bit because if you're making a motion to postpone to a date certain, you can actually debate that motion as opposed to a motion to table that's not debatable. So I'll leave that aside for a moment, but that's as a matter of Robert's rules, I think the motion that's being made. As to uh, the question of conflicts on, on the motion, the, the practice of this council has been, I guess, when I was thinking about this prior to the meeting, is I understand the practice, and I, I'd look to you all to correct me if I'm wrong about this, but I, I think uh, when this council has considered whether to pay legal fee reimbursement in the past, in 2017, Mayor, you had not removed your conflict at that point, and so three of you, the Mayor and the two council members to your left, recuse yourselves on that issue, on the issue of whether to pay reimbursement of legal fees. So we have precedent on that, uh, precedent, I'm using that term loosely, but that's the practice of the council on the issue of whether to pay or not. On related issues, on issues of whether to add that to the agenda or not, uh, whether to seek an AG opinion, and actually you've done that twice now, whether to seek AG opinions about legal issues related to that issue, and whether the mayor uh, has a conflict, all five of you have voted on all of those issues. <coughs> so um, I, I think the practice has been, and I, I uh, have not disagreed with it, uh, is that if you're dealing with uh, ancillary procedural issues, all five of you have been voting on it. Not, none of you have recused yourself on the issue of adding it or not to the agenda, seeking an AG opinion about it or not, and whether the, the very specific issue of whether or not the mayor has a conflict, all five of you voted. Uh, Council Member Gregory, you actually abstained from that vote, but uh, you, you registered an abstention uh, on that vote. So I think on these, on these procedural issues, the practice has been that you all vote and uh, you've not uh, recused yourself. And uh, it's, it's easy for me to say that on the core issue, uh, are, is the city going to pay reimbursement that those of you that are conflicted can't participate in that? I don't disagree, though, that you can, you can participate on <coughs> on these ancillary issues, procedural issues about whether that issue is going to be on the agenda or not and when it's going to be on the agenda. And then the last comment, Mayor and Council, about that is, uh, as I understand the way Doug has laid out um, this proposed motion in the staff report, this is not a motion to kill the item. It's not a motion to make it go away forever or indefinitely. It's just a motion to not consider it until you've got the AG uh, opinion back at which point the council would consider it. So for all those reasons, I think you can all vote. <coughs> That's been the practice. Thank you. There's a motion and a second. Uh, uh, so discussion. The uh, I th I, there's a motion, right? And so of order, I believe the city attorney said it's not a debatable. Item. Yeah. No, uh, I said the opposite. Um, I said that uh, although the last mo the last action that you took a couple of items ago on the the Carver County Road project was to table until you hear back from the University of Minnesota. Although that was phrased as a motion to table, I think technically if we all took out our handy dandy little Roberts rules, I think technically that is a motion to postpone to a date certain. And unlike a motion to table, a motion to, ta uh, to postpone to a date certain is debatable. So uh, if I'm right about that, Mayor, you're the uh, parliamentarian, so I guess you'd have to make that call. But uh, if I'm right about that, then this is really a motion to postpone to a date certain to until you get the AG opinion back. And if which, that's right, a motion to, to uh, postpone is debatable. Uh, which means we can have the discussion. Okay. So, uh, so, uh, so let's, uh, let's look at what the Attorney General did back in July of, of 13. He basically came back and didn't answer the question. It was, it was a non-answer. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, if we allow this item to continue to be uh, uh, delayed, then uh, we may never ever get to a vote because of the fact that they don't want us to vote. Uh, on the payment of their personal legal fees. And my concern is quite simply, we come up uh, and we run into the same situation that happened last year where the city manager has already told me that he intends to pay these legal fees and this kind of procedural motion uh, prevents the council, the non-conflicted uh, council members from voting on the issue. I don't think a procedural motion should be able to be used uh, to delay or avoid the council making a decision on, on this topic that is clearly uh, of intense interest all across Victoria. Uh, so that's my comments. Council member vote. 
I disagree. Council member, oh, I'm sorry. I think ahead. we should uh, vote on it. And uh, I, the current uh, recommendation on the floor is fine with me. Uh, Council member uh, Gregory. Uh, um, with respect to the mayor voting on this, I think he's made his point clear that he intends to vote. And in your legal memo that you wrote, I don't know, back way back when, uh, the seven papers memo, I think you indicated that this council lacks the legal authority to prevent the mayor from voting. So regardless of whatever the attorney general comes up with, I mean, the attorney general has an opinion. Obviously, it's, it's an important opinion, but I think the mayor has already indicated that he intends to vote. And in your opinion, this council lacks the legal authority to prevent him from doing so. Mayor, yeah, and go just ahead. on that point, that point's been made before, and I, I don't think I've responded to it, and if I have, I haven't done it clearly enough, so let me try again. That, that was my opinion then, that remains my opinion now. If, if the AG comes back and says, and you can actually see this in the list of questions that I submitted to the AG, if the AG comes back and says, no, the mayor is conflicted um, and, uh, and, and should act accordingly, the mayor has not waived his First Amendment rights. Uh, he, just like any citizen, has the right to speak in appropriate forms and in appropriate places. And I'm not aware, as my memo said, I'm not aware of an, a, me a mechanism by which a city council can say, we've decided and the AG has decided that you're conflicted, you're now gagged from registering your vote. I don't think a city can do that. The city does not have to count that vote, though, and that's the point of the AG opinion request. Simply because the mayor lodges a vote if he's conflicted and if the AG says his vote should not count, then his vote should not be counted. So you're right, my opinion before said, and I stand by it today, we can't stop the mayor from voting, even if the AG says, Vos is right, he's conflicted. The, the AG is not gonna say, and now I'm imposing a gag order on the mayor to never speak again on this issue. There may be consequences, and the mayor may vote uh, and, and do it with a conflict, and there may be legal consequences to that, but we can't stop people from speaking. Doesn't it take a court order to, to not count the vote? Well, uh, I think the AG is going to weigh in on that. Uh, assuming the AG responds to our request, that is one of the issues that's teed up. That's one of the questions that's teed up. Do you think there's precedent? Is there precedent for, yeah, Somebody if you're asking if, if there's precedent for courts weighing in on the question of whether a conflicted member's vote should count, yes, there is precedent. And the courts have said that that vote should not count. So, um, and I, I Think there may be not agreement about those cases, but I think we're going to get to hear from the AG about that. But who gets to decide that? It's the court, not the AG, correct? No. no. I, I, we, uh, Mayor, we talked about this at the last meeting. You were right in making the point that the AG's opinion is not the same thing as a court's opinion. Thank you. But it is followed. The AG's opinion is routinely followed by cities and city attorneys around the state, and there is a legal reason for that. There's a statute that says cities are, in, are protected, in effect, when they follow AG opinions. There's no legal liability to a city that follows the AG's opinion. So a uh, couple of comments. The, the, uh, when the council uh, approved you sending that letter in, it was sent in uh, almost like it was already uh, ready to go. It was sent in just in a matter of days after the council meeting. Uh, uh, but this council denied me any sort of representation so that my point uh, 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 and my uh, attorney's views uh, were put in front of the Attorney General before they make, uh, made any comment. Further, uh, when you sent that opinion that I paid for out of my own pocket and received, that opinion was not written for the purpose for which it's being used. In the typical legal process, uh, 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 in something like this, my understanding is that my attorney would write an opinion. Uh, uh, you would be able to rebut that, which is really what your memo does. And then there would be a reply brief or the equivalent thereof from my attorney. Um, uh, further, uh, and that of course didn't occur, and the council didn't allow me to have any sort of representation for my uh, my position uh, or the legal arguments that would support my position. Further, the uh, when I reviewed your letter that you sent to the uh, attorney general, uh, uh, I did not see any mention that my wife and I are no longer petitioners, even though you had mentioned you saw that in the filings that the plaintiffs did submit to the Supreme Court, which was accepted. My wife's name and my name were not included in that other than in a minor footnote. Uh, uh, my attorney, upon hearing that, sent a letter to the Attorney General, which I believe is included in the packet, uh, pointing out that material uh, 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 difference. 
The reason I bring this up is similar to what happened in July 19 when you, or I'm sorry, July of 17 when you asked the Attorney General for opinion uh, on those uh, previous issues. I think the same thing happened where you wrote a letter that, in my opinion, was uh, uh, written to get a particular outcome. Um, I think the same basic process has occurred here. I think it's a very important material fact and should have been uh, clearly articulated to the Attorney General, not in a footnote, that my wife and I are no longer plaintiffs. And then, in fact, we had re, uh, recused ourselves, removed ourselves from the appellate case prior to that case even being announced. Further, I'd like to uh, uh, remind everybody that's listening uh, uh, that when I ran for election and was elected, I was already an appellant. The residents knew that uh, coming in. Uh, uh, and yet they elected me to go ahead and represent their point of views. Saying the, 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 clearly there's a legal argument here, there's two sides. Uh, my attorney has said even when I was an appellant, uh, um, uh, I did not have a conflict, and now that we're uh, not part of the Supreme Court case, we didn't participate in the discussions, we have nothing to do with that, we being my wife and I. Uh, uh, when I asked my uh, attorney about that, he, he pretty much said there's no way that I have a conflict. I'm, I was elected to represent the citizens, and that's what I intended to do. Now, uh, I'm, I'm fine with delaying uh, uh, and waiting for the Attorney General to, uh, opinion to come back because we don't know what it is, but I'll only do that on the condition uh, that I have a guarantee from uh, Doug Reeder, who is not here, but I believe he stated this before. Uh, but I think because of the signatures required, uh, I think if the finance director agree, also agrees here uh, in the council meeting that no payments will be made until such time as we have that opinion in hand, and I can get that assurance from the council, then I don't mind tabling this until we hear back from the attorney general. So, uh, Kelly, would you agree to make sure that you execute no documents paying any legal fees or expenses related to the ongoing Supreme Court case and the personal legal fees of the four defendants until such time as we hear back from the Attorney General and the Council has an uh, opportunity to address that, uh, whatever the Attorney General happens to say? That, that seems like an inappropriate request to make that violates policy and procedure. No, I think it's a reasonable look request to make. Mr. City Attorney, can you <clears throat> address that? If, if we don't accept that, then basically what we're allowing is a procedural motion to avoid the council so that they can get their legal fees paid, which I think uh, uh, raises serious questions as far as violations of the Minnesota statutes that specifically prohibit somebody from participating in a discussion related to where they have a direct financial interest. And by doing this procedural motion to prevent the council from taking a vote tonight on an item that was tabled specifically for this meeting so that we could discuss it in this meeting and vote on it, now it's being tabled again. I think it's only reasonable to make sure that nothing happens behind the scenes and that this doesn't get paid until such time as we hear from the Attorney General and the full council can take that uh, opinion up. Because what happens if the Attorney General comes back and says there's no conflict? Then, then the council has been robbed of the ability to, to, in accordance with the open meeting law, set a policy specifically uh, as that statute says we can do on the payment of legal fees. Yeah, Mayor, I, I, I understand your point completely. Um, I'm hesitant to represent Doug's views on this, but I think you've accurately said what he said at a prior meeting, which was that he had no intention to pay uh, uh, until he brought the request for payment to the city council's attention. So I think you've accurately relayed what he said at a prior meeting. I don't want to speak for where he's at now. He's oh, that's fine. He's not here. If he said it at a prior meeting, why does it have to be said again? Because uh, I want it's on the record. I want assurance. The I will not sign the check, but it takes two signatures on the checks. Um, uh, Kelly, would you agree not to take any action? Do you remember Doug saying that? I, uh, I do recall a conversation with uh, Mr. Reeder where he did indicate that he would be waiting for the Attorney General opinion for uh, that. So. Then I'm fine with that. Is there further discussion? Okay, there's a motion on the table to table this until such time as the Council receives uh, the uh, opinion from the Attorney General. Uh, and then brings it up in, in, in the next available council meeting to discuss that. All in favor, uh, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Uh, this is tabled until we have the Attorney General opinion. Next item. Reports of the City Manager. Uh, Kelly, do you want to? Uh, yes, there's a couple of items in the correspondence section, um, but 
there's nothing really to report on those uh, or anything else. All right, thank you, uh, Bob. Uh, mayor and council, not anything other than what we just said, which was that, uh, Mayor, as you reported, I did send in the request that I was directed to send in. Um, it, I hadn't actually worked it out in advance, but it was a very short letter, uh, Mayor, as, as you and council know. It's a page and a half long. It attached, Mayor, as you pointed out, uh, both the opinion that you had received and the opinion I had given previously, as well as several other uh, attachments. Uh, that went in, I believe, on February 15th. Uh, and so I'd be optimistic to get a response uh, from the AG sometime soon, maybe even before your next council meeting. Uh, and I th think that's all I have to report. Thank you. Uh, council Member Crowley, report? No report. Uh, council Member Striegel? No report. Council Member Vote? No report. Council Member Gregory? And no report. Uh, and I have no uh, report. Uh, I move we adjourn. Is there a second? Second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 We are adjourned. <laughs>